it's okay. So a brick and mortar company, uh, an an old an old business, something that had a, a physical a physical presence before the web. There was a time before the web. Uh, it was a dark time. So <clears throat> uh, banks, uh, postal service. Um, I think that's it. That's probably all. Um, <laughs> automotive, anything, anything where you have a physical, your, your digital transformation companies. Um, now that doesn't mean that we exclude uh, startups in this in this talk. It's about dealing with the giant, the big corporate machine, right? The them, the business. Um, so, uh, who am I? Um, I'm told I look like that. Um, <laughs> uh, these are some logos of things that I'm sometimes affiliated with. Uh, I run the Angular uh, meetup here in Melbourne. I assist with running the Angular meetup in Brisbane. I run the Angular conference AU. Uh, I sometimes do work when I'm at Australia Post, but mostly I just hang out there. Um, and I'm co-organizing uh, GDD DevFest, which if you haven't heard about, go look it up. It's uh, coming up in three months, so you got a lot of time to save up the $26 for the ticket. <laughs> It'll be awesome. Google Developer Group. Yes. <laughs> I'm a very organized organizer. So now that I've instilled confidence in you, <clears throat> let's talk about getting onto that new thing. Right? And it doesn't, it's not necessarily tech, but we're all tech-minded people here, so it's... It's the thing, it's, it's the pattern, it's the process, it's the technology. Because I'm a developer, it's a little bit development focused, but it, not necessarily. The last project I worked on was a style guide, which a little bit design orientated, kinda, by name. So, <clears throat> we're gonna be in, assessing something new. There's a flow chart of how to get the business to buy into this. Um, your, your whole process to getting uh, to be allowed to do it, which is ridiculous that we need a process to be allowed to do what we were hired to do, but this is often how it goes. So don't worry too much about this. We're going to break it down into little digestible parts because despite the fact that this presentation is filled with flowcharts, I'm not a big fan of them. <clears throat> so you found something new. The first thing that you want to do is you want to assess if it's good for your app. Is it good for your app? No. Stop. All right? No. That's... But if it is good for your app, you need to list why. You need to sort this out, right? Like, you feel it. You, okay, we should do this because... And if you don't have your follow-up, when you're, when you're pitching this to your peers, to the business, to... Your managers, you've got nothing, right? You need to you need to know where you're going, and that needs to be relevant to several aspects of your app because you're going to speak to different people who have different interests in your app. So first, the project management triangle. Um, I think most people have probably seen this: scope being the features that you're given to implement, time being your timeline, and cost being the amount of money that they want to throw at it. So when you're looking at your new thing that you want to you want to get in, it's probably outside of the features that they they want, which means it's going to add to the time that they've allotted for you to do something new. But chances are they're probably not going to throw more money at it. So how are we going to squeeze it in there and still manage the quality output that we want? Well, we can because often these new processes, these new technologies, these new things that we're looking at, are actually going to speed things up. But we need to evaluate how that's going to happen. Probably get to that. Another thing is <clears throat> thinking about the longevity of your app. If you're not going to be touching this, if you don't do style uplifts, if you don't do touch the code more than like every week, then it's going to start getting stale and it's going to take longer to, to uplift it. And you're going to end up running in mud again. Now, some things will offer you uh, deprecation warnings. And that means that if you haven't touched it in three or six months, you can go back lift it up and say, hey, I just need to do this checklist of things. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's arbitrary. Sometimes it's actually you've fallen behind the styles. Well, you're not going to get an alert about that. You need to be constantly on them. So if it's going to be a dramatic change, you're going to have to have a, 
a process for constantly updating them. And if you don't have one, then maybe it's not right for your app. Another thing is a blank slide. No. <laughs> um, you need to think about the talent that you have. Um, not just yourself, but the people that you work with. Um, you need to know that they're going to be able to pick this thing up and that they're going to be able to contribute to it and they're going to be able to carry it when you find a better job. Because I hope you all find better jobs. So you don't want to walk into the office one day after suggesting this new groundbreaking technology and walk in and go, oh, one of the devs is lost. Oh, another, oh my God. Oh, 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 I didn't bring any dog treats. Um, but it's not just the, the developers you have, it's the developers or the, the designers that you want to have, right? Because hopefully your company is going to grow, because if they grow, you get paid more. You get paid more. So you need to worry about what people can be brought on. If you have another project that's starting, you need, you need uh, new uh, digital designers, new, new UX, new uh, front-end developers, new project leads, you're gonna need this software to be in a market where there are people that you can find. Side note, that feeling when you try to download a Lionel Richie meme and realize you already have several in your downloads directory from other presentations. <laughs> not embarrassed. So, going through this checklist of whether or not it's the right decision, I would like to show you a bad decision that I've come across in the last few years. There was a project where we had a header, a generic header that needed to be on all of our apps, right? This is HTML, right? And JavaScript. It's just a little, right? The, the header. You know, we, we've all seen headers on apps. It usually has a little logo of the brand that you're doing. Maybe a little login button. So we wanted to have a consistent one across all of our apps. And a team was tasked with just putting this, just putting this little header in. And these guys really, really wanted to use Inferno. It was the cool new library. We talked about it, and we were like, oh, it's not really necessary for them, but they wanted to use it. So they put it in to inject one HTML element on the page. They added this 20 kilobyte, this 20 kilobyte library, because it was a passion choice, right? And I, I know I'm saying this like I'm making fun of them. And I went on to come up with a library that's 20,000 times smaller <laughs> that does the same thing. But I'm not, I'm not mocking them. These, these are actually brilliant developers. But the, the problem is we often think that we're making these decisions logically, right? We're, we're professionals. We're, but we are emotionally motivated as creatures. So we need to field this across other people. We need to, we need to actually work with other people. <laughs> we, need, we, need to, we need to progress this to... to to find out if maybe, maybe you're just making this decision out of, out of passion. So now we have our library. We need to start working towards what it's going to be, where we're, where we're going to be, our new process. Um, it seems a little abstract, but you might notice that from 1977, the apple holds the same shape. So if you plug it in, to whatever you're doing, to your, your letterhead, to your app, swapping it out with the next one, very easy. It takes up the same space. And that's where we want to start going, because that's the way that we're going to get these things moving forward. Getting people on board. OK, so now we need to, now we need to actually rally the team. We need to, huh? see, told you we'd get back to the, uh, <clears throat> whatever that's called, uh, flowchart. So now we have to ask, are other people interested? Do we have other, other teammates? Do we have peers that are interested? If the answer is yes, great, team up, done. Move on. Um, there's actually a line that you can't see there because it doesn't exist that connects yay team up to uh, do you have a majority? Because here's the thing. Uh, lucid chart uh, gives you a limited number of, no. Uh, <laughs> so um, you, need, you, need to, you need to have a majority, right? If there's, if there's one of you in a group of four, or if there's 20 of you in a group of 100, you, 
you can make this decision for everyone and just go out and do it. But chances are, you, everyone's going to think you're a jerk because you've just forced something on them. Nobody likes things being forced on them. And if you don't get people on board, you're going to be alone in this. So <clears throat> working from here, I put together, you Xers, be kind to me here. I put together some personas that I've dealt with as I've tried to uplift things in the past. Yes, yes. Why wouldn't I be? Uh, there's, you already have to deal with one loud guy. I feel like five women would balance that out. <laughs> some reasonability. So the first thing about dealing with all of the personas, and this is why, I, I presume, uh, you actors and re researchers do personas is so that you can begin to empathize, so you can begin to understand how these people work. Because their decisions on paper, their reasoning for their decisions is based on their ability to argue. And not everyone's great at arguing. But if you understand some of the backstory, you can, you can start making the arguments for them. You can start understanding why they do what they do or why they disagree. So it's kind of a little bit about empathy. You gotta try and walk a little bit or just sleep or snuggle in their shoes. Um, figuratively, don't, it's well awkward to do it in person climbing under the desk. So I'm gonna start uh, with Lilo. Uh, Lilo is the person that is into a competing idea. Um, I'm not gonna delve too much into these because going through all the personas would take a long time. It's almost like it's something that people would do for a living. Um, <laughs> Lilo is really, really into the opposing idea. And the problem is, she's so into the opposing idea, well, as much as you are into yours. So you're, you're gonna be at loggerheads. I don't even know what that means. Um, so you're gonna have a hard time convincing her. And she's gonna have a hard time convincing you. And 50% of the time, you're just not gonna get there. You're not gonna get there. But what you should be doing is recognizing that someone else is this passionate. So you should go and learn this technique. You should go and learn it, shed yourself of whatever biases you have, like genuinely invest yourself in it. Someone was speaking here at the web meetup a couple of weeks ago about doing a, a couple of months ago, weeks, um, about doing a swap where two people had competing ideas. And what they did was they tried to, they tried to prove the other person right. And they ended up really happy with the result. Uh, that, that, that's a brilliant one. But if you can't get the other person on board for doing that, because sometimes that happens, you've got to do it. You have to get on board with their idea. And at least then when you come back, if you're still fervent that your idea is right, you can speak to them in their language. You can relate. You can draw comparisons. And it will get them on board. Lily. I don't know. Most of the names begin with L. I don't know why. I just, I just seriously, I just stole these from the Nintendo website. <clears throat> um, this person wants to be on the cutting edge. Um, so whatever you're proposing isn't like bleeding edge enough. They're like, oh yeah, but why do this when we could, well, because we can afford to do this, because we have the talent to do this. These, these people are normally really, really good at their jobs, but they're really driven to do more than you can get everyone else to, to do. Right? They're, they're, they're out ahead. And they're amazing this way. So if you let them know that, that you agree, if you let them know that you understand, that you hear them, that you support them, then they will be amazing at doing proof of concepts for you, helping other people get skilled up, um, helping to convince others that, that this, is, this is what you want. But in order to get there, in order to get there, you have to understand and support their ideas. Lucia, the L's still. Um, this is the person that's uh, struggling to keep up. The person that's struggling to keep up is, maybe, maybe it's not that they, they're not capable. Maybe it's that they have fatigue, which I think is more common. Um, normally people don't get these jobs just from some Mr. Bean-like folly. Uh, <laughs> fatigue is, is really common. And all this person needs is help to get on top of this new one. If they know how to do it, they will completely support it. But if it's some new random buzzword that they're overwhelmed by, they're gonna be resistant. So all you need to do is just take some time and hang out with them. 
Hang out with them. Just show them how it will benefit them. Show them how to do it. And they will, not only will they support it, but because they've already got it, they will stay on track with it and they will help keep everyone moving ahead with it. Helen, the person that doesn't understand the new tech and doesn't want to use it until they do. Now, I worded this badly. They can, they have the potential to understand the new tech. They've just only heard the buzzword. They haven't looked into it and they're like, oh, wait, why would I use this? These people are great. At, at first, it doesn't seem like they are, but what they do is they help you firmament your argument. These people normally have a great uh, mental picture of how everything is structured, which means that they can help you find the flaws in your plan of implementation, which means that you'll be able to fix things before you try and implement it. Right? It also means that you'll be able to put a better argument to forward to the business. Next we have May, the person that's too excited about the tech. The person that's so energetic that anyone that has any trepidations starts pulling back and shrugging in their shoulders. Right? These people, amazing. They're so easy to get on board. They're normally really good at it. The problem is that their energy is overwhelming to others. The best thing about these people is getting them on documentation, getting them to help you write out your lists of why, <coughs> helping, uh, helping you get your, your, your proof of concepts out. But putting that energy to places, they balance out. And then they start giving everyone else a nice, a nice walkway to join. So based on these, which I've compiled from the last 10 years of upgrades, I've tried to put at least three people into each one. So based on these and the, the, the experience that I've I've had pulling people together into uh, uh, some modernization. I reckon if you've done this, you probably have a majority. Now from the majority, we just need to get the business on board. I think I mentioned earlier that it seems a bit ridiculous that we need to get the business on board with what we're planning to do that they've paid us to do, but sometimes they can be risk adverse. That's part of their business, I don't know. Just a code monkey. So getting the business on board, I found often if the business is resistant, they're always like, oh, what about, what about this other department? Right? What about this, other, oh, is, is marketing okay with you changing this design? Is security okay with you using this library? Oh, does this follow the engineering roadmap? It's, okay, cool. If you go to see those other departments, 90% of the time, if they have a problem, they will tell you what it is and how to fix it. So you go, adjust that in your presentation, get their approval, and now you come back to the business with their support. You might notice, if you look closely at this flowchart, it says, does it affect other departments? And whether it's no or yes, you go talk to them and get their support. Because now all of a sudden, your presentation, your pitch to the business, is that much stronger. And I am certain, like 90% of the time, other departments will help you, especially if you're taking work away from like not work away from them, if you're taking pressure off of them, right? If you're taking responsibility for something, oh, people are really happy for you to take responsibility. <sighs> so now the business is like, okay, okay. Why do we need to do this thing? Okay, I'm sure everyone here already knows this. So I'm gonna try and skim through these ones really quickly. These are so tedious. Maintenance costs. This is why we need to be modern, right? Now, I, I actually like this statistic. In any place with more than 100, it says devs, but uh, 100 plus employees, right? Where you have the, uh, a large code base or, or a, a, a massive selection of, of styles or workflows, you're gonna spend half of your budget just trying to keep things going forward. But the thing is that if you actually modernize, if you're, if you're just pushing a little bit forward, if you spend one sprint, one project iteration, whatever the hell you call it, one project, just pushing a little bit forward, then instead of just trying to keep this thing working, you're gonna be constantly uplifting it. You're gonna be keeping it working. <coughs> you're gonna be keeping it modern. That saves money in a myriad of ways. That, that, that gives you access to faster, um, faster processes, like templating, uh, code generation, um, security fixes. Which brings me to my next one, security. This is, this, is, this is the Black Hat Conference this year. Well, wait, is it 2017? No, last year. 
last year. 2017, DEF CON and Black Hat had 25,000 people go. 25,000 people. How many people are in, in security here? Your phone. Your phone is in security. Great. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, like, I have no idea what this year's latest, like, security things. These people know a, a hundred thousand different ways to hack my app, my website, my front door that I don't know about. Right? So we want the new stuff to come in by people who have actually thought about this and just dealt with it for us. Right? There's this absolution that we get by moving forward. The other one, I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of this argument. Well, I am because it works, but I'm not a competitive person. The competition. <coughs> the competition really gets marketing and the producers involved, right? Oh, whoa, oh, oh. And nobody really knows what the competition is doing, so you're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. The competition just moved to Fingham. We should move to Fingham. Oh, the competition did it. <laughs> You'll be on it right away. Right away. Uh, incidentally, uh, this is from the Mods versus Rockers ride, which happens in Brighton every year. The, uh, Everyone with Vespas and everyone with a rock and roll motorcycle goes up and they do a tug of war and they have a fashion contest and it's really macho. It's awesome. The customers. All of this should be done for the customers, right? Uh, giving them a better visual experience, giving them a better flow, giving them better decision-making process, smaller bundles, faster connections, right? And I literally had an engineering manager say to me, oh, well, will the customers notice? Will the customers know that you've, you've, that you've done server-side rendering to have the, the, the page uh, start faster? Well, well, no, but let's not assume that everyone's an idiot photographing glasses on the floor in a museum. But the thing is, given enough time, given enough time, I guarantee, I guarantee everyone will be able to tell the difference. <laughs> so, I think I touched on this, but the business support, the people that you need to pitch this to, architects, engineering leads, um, design leads, um, producers, owners, um, each time that you hit one of these people, even if it sounds like a no, what they're going to do is they're going to give you the power to to pitch this, to drive this technology forward. So finally, uh, oh, I'm so glad we're here this early. I was really scared I was gonna be up here forever. <laughs> you were too, I can see you. Um, implementation, implementation. Now, I've gone with a little bit of a techie version of this because um, um, so obviously the business has been like, okay, all right. We believe in you, you can do this. Great, burn it all down, start over. <laughs> okay, maybe, maybe not. Um, so chances are you're not gonna be given complete carte blanche to start over a complete greenfield project. So you need to start iteratively. You need to start with a proof of concept, something that you're willing to throw yourself into to show it working. Don't do this one, it ends badly. <laughs> You need to figure out where, where you're going to do this, where you're going to get this in, what project, what feature, where in your, your pipeline of all your deliverables, you're going to start adding something new. You're going to have to find a place to squeeze it in. The business knows you're adding it. You already have their support. But it's new. It's a new workflow. It might require twice as many meetings. It might require helping people understand a new format of ideation. It might require somebody learning a new framework. So, <clears throat> bloat your estimates. <laughs> not a lot, not a lot. We're not trying to milk the company for money. What we're trying to do is make sure that we reliably deliver on what we're saying. Oh, I'm so businessy. We, we want to just give ourselves that little bit of margin of error when we do this, right? We, if, they get, if they get what's promised, they're happy. So if you need to edge it out a little, edge it out a little. 
It will always take longer than you think. Now, before the project starts, I suggest a little bit of spring cleaning, right? Old assets, get rid of them. I didn't like the way that this was here, move it, right? The last thing you want to do is start a game of Jenga here. I've tried it. I mean, admittedly, I was playing with my cats. <laughs> and their dexterity level is pretty low. Even playing D&D. Cool. I, it still says I have Wi-Fi. All right, let's see if I can pull this back. Hey, all right, so. <laughs> Offline first, it's important, it's important. You know what, that's the first modernization we need to do. Okay, um, okay, so here, no. Okay, uh, sorry, yeah. I'll send out the link. Everyone get your phones up. <laughs> this is awesome because this is the end result. So it's kind of a big help. Okay, so oh, I can do it with hand gestures. I can do it with hand gestures. Let's <clears throat> we have an application. We have an application and the header needs to call off to a header service which calls the, the back end and comes back. Now when the header is updated, when you're logged in, that's gonna update the banner service. And the banner service is gonna call off to the, the database and get the details about what promotions we're gonna sell that, that customer. And now that we know who the customer is and what promotions we're selling them, we're gonna call off the cart and we're gonna see what things are in their shopping cart, right? And it's, it's all these trickle down dependencies. Everything's dependent on the login working and there's this, there's this frailty. What we want to move to is this, where there's one thing that manages it all, so we can just call it and get it back. Hmm. This is an imaginary app. If anyone's trying to figure out how to make this work, there's a whole bunch of stuff that I haven't put up there, so don't. <clears throat> now, in order to move to this, we want to take these chains here and block them with the local store. We want to put one in here, one here one here, and then as we start, as they, as, as they get used to the same interface, move it up to two, move it up to, we can start from one little piece of our application, one little piece of our, our design, where things aren't, where things aren't the most frail, and we can implement it the way that we want it. All right, great, we have this tiny little thing, it's inconsequential. Well, I mean, the shopping cart's not consequential. It's, it's kind of, as a consumer, it's kind of important. But we can start with the shopping cart, the last thing in the trickle down, and change that. And when that works, move up and move the welcome banner to the new technology. And when that works, move up and we move the header. And that way, if something happens, if there's a, a catastrophe with your project, with employment, with anything, as you go, fine, it still works. That means that you have this reassurance. I, I had these images. Um, you have this reassurance that even if it all goes wrong, that, that fortnight's work, solid. Right? You made it through that fortnight. Next fortnight. Next fortnight. And this progressive implementation gives you the means to say, oh, we're running behind schedule. Go with this. Pick it up. Next project. Well, it came back around and finished, great. So with that, we have a nice iterative uh, process. One of, one of the ways that we've uh, done this recently, uh, we're uplifting our, our, um, our styles and our style guide. And we have done, we've done components in the page, just little ones. And some of them, not to the new style, right? Hey, we're going, I'm making up stuff, we're going, uh, three pixel rounded borders to two. So we just change all the rounded borders. We just change all the rounded borders. We're moving some of the red to blue, but eventually it'll be all. 
It makes so much sense when you're dealing with something visual, but people forget about it when they're dealing with code, when they're dealing with interaction process, when they're dealing with um, the way that we work. This, this, this process of just changing little bits here and there gives us this, this security to move forward. And with that, we hit my final note. How relieved are you? My final note is know when you're done. Know when you're done, because you're going to press yourself forward to get here. And after you've got here, you, maybe it's going to not take the three months that you thought. And you're going to have to go back and uplift one thing, right? So it's three and a half months. But once it's over, you ne need to know, and you need to take that pressure off yourself. You need to have a definition of done for your uplift. There's the whole project that happens within it, and you normally have a definition of done. You have an agreement. But actually knowing that you've uplifted it, and you're like, okay, take a breather, right? It's just maintenance work now. You need to know that, because you'll end up stressing yourself out if you don't. And that, I'm not even gonna try the next slide, it'll just say loading. Uh, and that is uh, my process for uh, upgrading in a business. Thank <laughs> you.